You lose your line if it doesn't work. So, hello everybody. So, my name's, I've started the recording show. Yeah. I did. FYI. So, we have the uh, usual um, uh, CC license at the beginning of the talk. In addition to that, I encourage you to copy, share, take pictures, blog, tweet, and so forth, as long as you acknowledge where you got it from. So, uh, this is module 2A about uh, cloud computing and Amazon, and uh, same type of disclaimer as John had, and my contact information, and the tags for those people who use Twitter, and uh, the learning objectives for, oh, pointer. Learning objectives for our lecture today. So, I'm going to introduce you to cloud computing. We're going to use the wiki for the workshop, as, as Michelle just mentioned. How to log into the cloud, review databases using bioinformatics, and look at some cancer genome data, and spend a bit of time on UCSC and NIGV. How many of you, before you registered for this workshop, had never uh, logged into a command line prompt? Don't be afraid. Okay, just a few timid hands. Okay, this is good. Um, well, you'll 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 become pros after this. So, this, this is very good. So, um, just a bit of background: why we're using the cloud. Uh, John sort of alluded to it. That one of the uh, the the growth curves of uh, you've seen, and, and this is uh, presented in a, a paper by Lincoln Stein, who's our uh, the director at the YCR for informatics and a sort of a long-time uh, bioinformatics guru, although he predicted the term bioinformatics would disappear about this year. It didn't. Uh, so some gurus are wrong sometimes. Anyway, so this is the sort of the growth curve of data before next-gen sequence data. Uh, this is the growth curve of uh, hard disk storage capacity, the cost, uh, increase in cost. And this is the since next-gen so what we're going to be having soon in, uh, in the years to come, it's going to become more expensive to store a nucleotide than to actually sequence a nucleotide. And so this is a number, uh, never mind all the computes and the people and so forth, but just uh, the, the challenge is there. Of course, one of the, 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 the thing why you still want to store it, even though it's more expensive, as opposed to just resequencing again, is that a lot of the samples, especially the ones that we deal with in, in cancer genomics, are, are, are limited. So we don't have uh, incredible amounts of DNA. And so if you seek it with once, we want to keep the data around to be able to analyze it for a long time. Um, so we talked about the $1,000 genome, and soon maybe the $100 genome. This is just the reagents against. It's not the people in doing the work. The doubling time of sequencing and the doubling time of, of CPU and the the as I mentioned, the cost of sequencing and storage. So, the uh, so the in general, the, the challenges we're facing. We have lots of data. We have poor IP, IT infrastructure in many labs. There's obviously places like the OICR or the BC Cancer <coughs> Agency and so forth have dedicated armies of people small armies, not large armies, <laughs> of people dedicated to maintaining and, and, and keeping up infrastructure. The, um, the cloud as a solution that's sort of maintained elsewhere is a commercial uh, uh, entity or a private cloud, because that's also a uh, sort of a, it's not only, it's not as, you know, when is it going to happen, it's not what, if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen. Because we will need to, to, to use that kind of infrastructure in, in, in the future. So where do we go? We can write more grants, get bigger hardware, or look for the, to the sky. There's some companies. Unfortunately, this company doesn't exist anymore because it got bought off by another company. But basically, what it, its business model was to basically get DNA, sequence it, and then ship drives to Amazon, and then let people go look at their data and compute in their data at Amazon. So there is actually business models, and there are very secure ways of doing this, encrypting what's in the truck, encrypting what's at Amazon itself, encrypting uh, ways uh, you can, uh, making sure with, with fobs and, and very, you know, um, two level of security and so forth. So it's, it's very, it's very much 
I would argue that Amazon is, is probably even more secure than, um, than some of your institutional uh, IT infrastructure. Um, many people are already using the cloud. They don't even know it. Uh, people use Google Docs, Dropbox, Netflix, and Twitter are all things, web services and so forth, that are, are already on the cloud. The way uh, Amazon is able to sort of serve that, this kind of activity is uh, by having a very, very large number of football field size sort of data centers and having them all over the world. So there, there's three or four in the US, there's uh, Ireland, there's Australia, Singapore, uh, and a few other ones I forget. And so they are not just a single baseball, baseball, football field, but multiple football fields. And basically they come, these containers come in as a unit. They have all the HPCs, all the air conditioning, all the, the, the plugs, and they just bring it in and plug it in and just add it a thousand cores to, to their uh, data center. And it's just do that all the time and update it and so forth. So, uh, of course, it's uh, not cheap. Uh, getting, there's a challenge of getting files to and from there because you're still limited by the slowest um, uh, network bandwidth that's between you where you stand and where you want your computers, uh, where the uh, Amazon or whichever web service uh, is located. Uh, it's not necessarily the best solution for any, everybody. There's some standardization with respect to um, uh, cloud infrastructure, which is, is currently not there. So Amazon is standardized with the way they do things, but there are other, uh, Google and, and Microsoft do it differently, and, and they have different tools and so forth. There's the issue that John mentioned about personal health information and security concerns. And in the US, they have this thing called the Patriot Act, which allows the government to go look at anything without a warrant if they suspect that there's some terrorist activity involved. And so if you're sequencing the tumor of a cousin of a terrorist, uh, they may come and, and uh, just want to look at your DNA. I don't know that this has ever happened. I'm not sure if it's a worry that we shouldn't be worried about, but it's, a, it's an excuse and a concern that is always brought up every time we talk about this. And every time we try to open things up, people bring up this, this concern. The, 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 Personal health information is a real concern, and we've um, circumvented this. Circumvented is not the right word. We've uh, arranged it so that it wasn't a concern <laughs> this week by uh, using either uh, data sets which are fully uh, consented, so they're, they're public data sets, basically, so they're, we can use, even though they're from uh, human cell lines, so they'll look like real data. And we also, as John mentioned, we also we're doing like slices of it, smaller parts of it. Um, some of the advantages uh, for, at the Canadian Microsoft Workshop, we actually got a grant from Amazon, so we're actually getting this uh, uh, web service this week for free. So for free in the sense that we wrote a grant, so we we got Amazon dollars, and so that we're able to to do that in, in this class. But I think it's, it's very smart of Amazon. It's like giving crack to babies. Uh, <laughs> get you guys hooked. And then when you'll go home, they'll ask for your credit card. And then you'll, you're, you'll be, they'll be making money. And so, uh, so just keep that in mind before you get too excited. Um, there are ways. So, um, so it was very... It, you know, there was a, I think it was a 5 gig file size at one time at Amazon. And, They've changed that, so they've they've become they're much more bioinformatics aware, and so there's actually some very senior people at Amazon that are very much aware with the next gen sequencing technologies and the kind of things we need to do, and so uh, and again to sort of lure you into the they've actually making the upload of your data, so they used to charge for the tra just the transfer, never mind doing any compute on on the, they would charge you for the transfer. But now they, they don't charge for uploading. So you can bring all your data up to Amazon for free. It can take a while. But then the other thing they say says if you have really, really large sort of terabytes type file size that you want to transfer to Amazon, because they'll charge you for the storing it too, so uh, without doing any computing yet. But if you, want, if you have large data sets, they're really good. The other thing they say is they're really good at shipping stuff. 
And so Amazon is actually knows how to ship things around the world. And so you can ship your drives to Amazon, and then they'll hook up your, 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 your data the same way this other company did it. There is actually on Amazon already a, a number of, of data sets, like the 1000 Genome data set, which it, they, they're keeping there for free. So they, they actually they thought of it as an as a international sort of set that would be of interest to a lot of people. And so they, they're storing it and maintaining that for free. So you can go compute on it, uh, on the sort of the, the raw data for the 1000 genome that's available. They also make uh, what we are going to be using as a, an Amazon um, uh, machine image, or AMI. And uh, they make some of these images which have, for example, there's a um, Cloud Bar Linux one which has, you can go and look for it, and you can upload that one, and it has, from the command line, all the, 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 the sort of the biology, sort of next-gen sequencing type tools that you will want to use, and, and Blast, and a bunch of other things that are available, that are Perl libraries, all, all the kinds of things that you would want to have available for you to do if you were going to set up a computer. They basically, there's a Cloud Bio Linux group, they put it an AMI, on Amazon for people to, to download. And there's also Galaxy. I don't know if any of you have used Galaxy. We're not going to use Galaxy this week. But uh, there's a Galaxy image as well. So you can run. We are? Do you want to mention this workshop's AMI? OK. Well, yeah, so we're going to we'll get to it. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, there's another workshop, actually, um, which is what I thought Michelle was interrupting me for where we do the uh, high throughput, so we have a two-day high throughput bioinformatics workshop where we actually do Galaxy. So we bring up the, the same AMI that we're going to uh, use here and um, the, the Galaxy one as well. At the end of the, so we have actually a CBW AMI that we're basically put all the tools into and that we maintain at Amazon. So at the end of the workshop, with your own credit card, you can go and look up the CBW AMI and bring the same one. It will have the same tools and things like that that you used this week. That will be, we're going to be maintaining that at, at Amazon. So keeping an, an, an image at Amazon is not too expensive. And so we're happy to do that for the class. So we keep that uh, year round. And uh, so we're, I keep, we keep mentioning uh, Amazon Web Services. There are many other uh, flavors of clouds, private clouds commercial crowd, clouds, and so forth. And uh, by far, I would say that the Amazon one is the most uh, uh, well-maintained. Uh, it's got the best tools. It's got the most uh, user-friendly interface, the best documentation, the best support, and so forth. But it comes at a price. So in this workshop, we're going to have some tools that are on your computer. You can have some tools on the web and some things on the, on the cloud. And so you'll be sort of traversing all these spaces uh, quite uh, uh, easily. And, and uh, you're going to become efficient at sort of figuring out what's the best thing to do. Um, and there are different ways of using the cloud. So there's command line, like your very own sort of basically Unix box, which is what we're going to do in this workshop. And or you could use a web browser like Galaxy, which we're not going to do in this workshop. That is possible as well. So you can run Galaxy in Pennsylvania. You can run Galaxy in your own server at where in Toronto, or you can run Galaxy on the cloud. So there's different versions. So so we've loaded uh, data on this S3 bucket. We brought up an Ubuntu Linux instance and loaded a whole bunch of software for next-gen sequence analysis. We've then cloned this and made separate instances for everybody to, in the class. So when we load, log in, you're going to have your own machine. It's going to be your own virtual machine to, for yourself. And um, so you won't see other people's data and so forth. That said, you're basically all using the same password key. So it's not very secure from that point of view. And that's not the way you would do it normally. Normally, you'd have your own key that would be private to you and only you would know where it is on your computer and so forth. So the, this is a, this is not the standard, don't go and say, oh yes, let's share all our keys and things like that. That's not the way you do business because 
which your key will be a, your credit card number. And so uh, you have to sort of guard that the same way you would keep uh, financial information. And so, um, so we're going to have the same login file name with some exceptions and we'll talk about. And you're, you will have, uh, it, you, it will be more secure normally. So why do, do we, are we concerned about security? So we talked about this a little bit, and uh, John talked a bit about it. So for the, if I take the example of the ICGC, the International Cancer Genome Consortium, we have a lot of somatic mutation data, which are in themselves not identifiable, right? Unless you have that person's DNA, that person's tumor, you can match it that way. But a somatic mutation is not identifiable. It's a random, well, it's not random. It's a, it's a number of, of marks in your DNA which cause the tumor. But themselves are not, they're not like your germline variants who themselves are identifiable. So the germline variant data itself is considered uh, identifiable data, so you can identify the individual. And to get access to that data, normally at a, on a, at a any NIH website, at DBGAP, or at the EBI, or at the ICGC, you have to ask permission, and you have to prove to them that you're a real scientist, that you're going to do good things, that uh, you have good compute infrastructure that will, you know, prevent people from stealing your data. And that if you screw up, you're also getting the signature of somebody who's going to fire you. And they, the, the DACO office, the data, or the DB gap, and so forth, they know that person's name and they know who to contact if they need to, you need to get fired. So if you sort of do something bad, like trying to re-identify a sample, trying to give it to people that you're not supposed to give it to, and so forth, then they can sort of come and hit you with, with that kind of security. This is not a concern for us this week. The data we're looking at is all publicly public data, so you don't have to worry about that. But in general, when you want to look at sensitive data that is identifiable, that's got germline variants, that's got clinical data information that can be used to identify the individual, that usually you need special permission for. So on the ICGC, we have all of this, which is open data, which is a lot of which we're actually we're going to work with today. And there's all of this, which is con considered controlled access data, for which you have to get special permission. And I'm going to talk a bit about it more uh, this after, at, uh, yes, after lunch. So this is a website, so maybe you should all log in here and make sure if you haven't done so already. So you have this uh, website, and the second one is, is our workshop here. And it's got oogles and oogles of information on how to set up your laptop, some tutorial that you've all done, some readings that you've all done, and so forth. So, and then the day one uh, in information. So I'm a Mac person, and a Mac is really just a, a nice Unix box with a nice graphical user interface. I look across the class, it's about half, half, I'd say, of this class. So this slide is Mac-specific, and I have a few Windows slides that somebody made for me. Anyway, so we're going to be using the terminal. So the terminal is, in, uh, is hidden in uh, most, you'd think most, they really hit the terminal app. Uh, and there's actually alternatives uh, that, that, that can be used, but it's in the utilities folder in the uh, application folder. So if you go in here, you have, uh, and down here, terminal.app. So this app, once you run it, usually once it's on my desktop, I usually click to keep on desktop, so it's always there. So I have this one permanently on my desktop. And if you double click on that, then you get a, a window that gives you your command line prompt. And uh, if I type, so th this machine, actually this is an old slide because it's the wrong, or it's from another machine because this is actually, yeah, it is from another machine. This is actually, this machine is Beagle 8, this is Beagle 7 prompt. Uh, Beagle, all my laptops are named Beagle because of Darwin. He's traveling. 
<laughs> and so I've had lots of beagles. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so if we do ls command, uh, and I made a, a directory for CBW, so make their CBW, CD, CBW, ls minus L, then I, I LA, so a long listing with showing all the hidden files. Basically, this is an empty directory. So that's my starting, uh, the way I'm starting. Is everybody, everybody knows how to do this? Can everybody do it? Has everybody done it? Right, so far, so good. Okay, switch to the wiki page. There's a heading logging onto the Amazon cloud, crash course on cloud, uh, there's a cloud lecture, which is this lecture right now, you can download and keep. So we have, actually I think it's 50, 40 or 50, so there's two here. This is where the, the verge, the world divide between the, the Mac and the PC people. So I'm going to do the Mac. Per, so the Mac OS people. First of all, anybody on the Linux box here? Yes. Oh yeah. Well, you don't. <laughs> oh yeah. That's right. Okay. So Mac and, and Linux are, are are together. So basically, on the Mac, you sort of hit the control. And uh, you get this pop-up coming up, and you save this file as. And so that after you've done this, you should have this cwkey.pem, or uh, on the PC it's called uh, PAC. What is it? Is that right? PA. PPK. Yeah. So anyway, so this is the on on the Windows on the on the on the Mac. So. Uh, CBW key, and if you look, um, and so one instruction we tell you to do, and it's in the, the command is detailed, you should change uh, the permission. So the command is chmod 600, or you could do 400 as well, I think, uh, CBW, and then the file name. And if you do ls again, so the file is still there. Oh, my pointer is about to die. The file is still there, but if you look at the permissions, they're changed. So there used to be read, write, read, read, and so forth. And now it's only read, write by the file owner. If you look at what this file is, cat the, the, the file name, it's a, it's a text file, but it's, it's a long password, right? So, so we all have this file to log in. And it's all, we, you have to have this file to be able to log in to, to the cloud. And we've told the cloud to expect this file. So everybody is getting the same file. Normally, you need to have your own file. Just a quick crash course on those of you that, that don't know about permissions. Basically, a file name would have uh, read, write, rwx, rwx, rwx three times. And it relates to the read, write, and execute permission of the owner of the file, of the group that the owner belongs to, or what I refer to as the world, everybody else on the network. It's not really the world, but that's a sort of old Unix stuff. Basically, um, everybody else on the network, not necessarily people that are not in your group. And read, if you count, if you uh, put numbers, uh, add integers, read is four, write is two, execute is one. And you can add all of these number up, and every time, whatever sum you get, you know which integers were used to add up to it. So four plus two is six. There's only one way of getting six is adding four and two, so it's read and write. Four and one is is only there's only one, is five, and there's only one way of getting that. It's read and execute and so forth. So if I say change mode six zero zero, I'm saying read and execute. Oh, sorry, read and write. So four plus two is six for the owner, but not the group and not the world. And so the permissions go from um, what they are here, actually, I had on the, I should have put it on this slide. So they go from uh, read write. So they were six four four, and they gone six zero zero. Everybody got that? Everybody knows, understands that. Sorry, will you repeat it again? So basically, with the command. So what way did you change? Like, so so you have to change. So it has to look like this. It has to look like read. If you look, if you do a long listing, if you do ls minus la, it should look like this, like this one here. Read and write by the owner only, not by the world and not by the group. 
So if you, this is how it was before at the top, and this is how, after you run this change mod command, it becomes RW. And if you don't have that, it'll fail when you try to log in. So if it fails, they don't know you didn't do it. Uh, I'm asking people to do this change mod as, as I go along, yes. So, okay, you want me to pause? Okay, I'm happy to pause. I'm happy to take a sip of my coffee. We need to go into the like the C PW directory. Okay, that's a good point. Yes. So I made so I made a, a directory off my main directory. I made a CBW directory and that's where I'm putting everything today. And that's just doesn't have to be you could do whichever way you like, but that's an easy way of doing it. So you go to the command line, you go to your home directory and you create a directory called CBW. So M M K D I R make directory space CBW. In Unix, case matters and space matters. So don't forget about these things. So the upper or lower case is very important and um, spaces and so forth. There's actually a typo in one of my slides where I put a space, there should be one. So if you try to do what's on the space, yes, David. That's correct, yes. The Windows people, you can either look down the next few pages <laughs> there in the notes, there's that uh, actually. Uh, let me actually go to that to those pages right away. So let me squish. I'm gonna skip ahead to the Windows. So the Windows people, you're supposed to download a program called Putty. So you're supposed to install that program ahead of time. And these are the configuration for Putty from last year. So there's a. Uh, uh, and, uh, I need to go back to the home. These, there's another place. Uh, Ubuntu, that's correct. And, oh yeah, so here, this is the wrong file name. This is 2012, it should be 2013. So the Windows people, I mean, you don't have this file right now. You don't have this PPK file. You have uh, CBW 2013. So I don't need this or whatever it is called. So, so if you go back, if you go back, over here, you, you get to download this certificate here. So the Windows people download the one at the end of the paragraph. There's two certificates on top of each other. They might not be on top of each other. It depends how wide your screen is. But so the first one is for Mac, and the second one is for Windows people. So the first one is for Mac and Linux, and the second one is for Windows. This is important to get it right, because if you don't get it right, it's going to be a long week. Yeah. <laughs> so so you've got you've got to copy one file so far I've told you to copy is this first I to make a directory CBW and then uh, to make uh, the certificate uh, and, and download this file here certificate file it's a text file. It is a text file. Oh, yes. Yes. You have to change it, rename it to .ppk. That's correct. It is a text file, but it, it needs a, the correct uh, extension. .ppk. Yeah, your 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 uh, your PC is trying to be too smart. It's trying to outsmart the Mac. <laughs> That's true. It is. It does. Yeah. It, it, yes, true. They're both trying to outsmart each other. And this looks like a text file. <laughs> okay. Does everybody have it? No. So okay. That's why you have the very experienced TA there with you.
you see we'll be doing great things once we pass this first hurdle. Huh? It was easy in Windows. I was easy on the Mac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not coming. It's not starting Mac. <laughs> I think you're gonna lose. <laughs> Teach your own. I mean, it's whatever you you like. It's, it's important to have a machine you like. Why well, when I bought this thing, you came to Windows 8 and you couldn't get it? Oh, that's bad. You couldn't get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you yeah. have to specify to Linux. <laughs> you can go quite that far. <laughs> that's next. Give me it. Yeah. Let me get through the course first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. This one? Yeah. This first one or the second one? The first one. So, oh, yeah. So, so this first one here, this is actually, uh, I was going to mention later, but I, so the host name is the number you're putting there is the one behind your badge, right? So it's, you're not putting your CPW01 is for this instructor, whoever 01 is. But you put your own number here. So in the number, your number is the one behind your badge. And, and, and you put this, you copy this. This is the, the basically, that's the name of the instance that you're going to log into. Is the, is the SSH, would I put by 05 if that's what you're So, uh, okay, uh, oh yeah, zero 01. Oh yeah, 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 it's the first one. CBW, your number, SSH01.com is the name, that's our, everybody has that too, the same. Oh, so that's Yes. And we're going to do secure shell, SSH. And we're going to do, uh, you're going to save it and call it CBW. Okay. Okay. And then uh, the username is going to be Ubuntu. So we're all calling Ubuntu. All right, one second. I'm just going to go there with you. Okay. And then prompt. Uh, X term, I think that's probably default settings. <coughs> Everything else is left blank. Okay. Next screen. And then, so you can browse and get this file here, which is going to have the right number, the right name, the one you've downloaded already. This is a file that you downloaded from the wiki. Right, and then you, uh, and these are probably default settings. So did you look? Did you say from the? You have that now. Okay, so and what does it say? It says login as. Yeah. Login as Ubuntu? U B U N T U, all the right Yeah, it's I wish I should have practiced more on the Windows box. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> Are we okay? Is it looking good? No. Uh, Zybin. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, the Mac people, I haven't showed you how yet, but if you want to. So if you go to this page, 
So the Mac people, if you want to try logging in, so you do S from a command, from the prompt, you go SSH minus space minus I space the key, the C CBW key dot PEM space Ubuntu, which is your username. So we're all called Ubuntu. So we all have the same username at CBW. CB, and the number is your number behind your badge, dot ssh01.com. So, so the cbw number dot ssh.com, that, uh, that part, that's basically the user at this machine. So we are, we, so Zyben has set up 40 machines. Labeled. Oh yeah, and if your number is one through nine. No, it's already there. Oh, you have that on the on the badge. Yeah, don't forget to put the zero before the the digit. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Very good. I'll tell you. Don't don't do, don't do that yet. Don't worry about that yet. You don't have to copy anything right now. Okay. Good. So, who does not have it yet? You still don't have it. Our Linux is. It's a good operating system with a bad no, uh, you're, 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 you haven't, just, I think we have one left. Yeah. yeah. And I think somebody's on top. A Windows person is helping. Okay. Ben? Oh, no. You okay? Is she okay? Maybe you want to, I think there's one more left. Okay, good, very good, very good. Sorry about that, uh, Linux and Windows people. Okay, so the so if you do this, you should be able. Let me actually let me do that myself. So I'm going to actually escape my PowerPoint here. I'm going to switch. So I'm going to do. Oops. So, so this is my prompt, right? So I do SSH minus I cwiki.pm Ubuntu at cbw27, that's my number, dot SSH, okay? And if I type that in, this is good. So Ubuntu, I'm now Ubuntu at this IP address. <laughs> this is me, right? So if you have something like that, you, 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 you have success. You are now on Amazon. Aren't you excited? I'm very excited. <laughs> so let's try um, ls minus la. Whoa. Let me take that over. Just do ls minus l. And... Let me clear the screen first. LS minus L. There we go. So if I do LS minus L, so that's a long listing of the files and directories I have in my directory, in my home directory, because when you log in, you, you start in your home directory. So I have a bin directory. I have a course data. Uh, L in the first column. Is everybody listening to me? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So the first column tells you if it's a file, a directory, or a, uh, a link, um, symbolic link. So bin is a directory, l is a link, and you can see it's a link because you see courseware, 
arrow is actually linked to another file somewhere else. So it's a symbolic link to that to that directory. But we made it easier for you. So you want to go see the course data, just go look to course data. You don't have to type slash media slash tbw data slash course data. So just to make it, it's a way of making it easier. How big is the course data? How much is how much is what? How big? How big? What is the size of the course data? Oh, how? Oh yeah, 120 gigs. So it's not that much. It's kind of that's not much. No. <laughs> so I, I did you mention? Yeah, you mentioned. So we have at OICR we have four petabytes almost. So three and a half petabytes. So it gives you so there's gigs, tera, peta. So it gives you. And it's it takes sometimes it takes days to copy a file over. From one place to another place. <laughs> uh, let me just go back to my. Okay, so we did this. So if you wanted to copy files from an instance, uh, this would be actually a one way of doing it. So you could copy um, SCP. It's not very clear here on the. It's a bit out of focus. Uh, so, so a secure copy, so it's a secure way of copying files. Minus I, you use this password uh, file, right? So you do minus I, then log in to where, to where you want to copy the file to, and what it is you want to copy. So you want to have copy this long path. I'm not. Don't do it now. I'm just telling you how you would do it. And then period means here. So you copy from there to here. So. The other very useful thing that we have, if you put click on this, you should do right now. If you go to your browser and you type in HTTP colon slash slash CBW your number dot SSH01.com, you'll actually have a browser of all your files. So it's very convenient. Just so if you want to copy files from your browser from your Amazon account to your local account to your laptop. You just go here, click on it, and save. So that's a very simple way of getting files. Again, this we opened up all the ports. We made it easy for the whole world to be looking at this. They're not much interest in them doing it. They can't put anything. They can look at it. And so don't put any personal information there. But basically, this is not the way you would set it up on Amazon normally. But this is the way we set it up for this week to make it easy for you to transfer files and things like that. And it's very well documented on Amazon. If you want more documentation or more help, you can pay for it. They're very happy to provide the service for a fee. It's a window stuff. So at this point, your laptop is actually ready for the workshop, right? Uh, if you don't know, if it's not, then you know where to get the information you need, or you just don't have any lunch. Uh, you know where the wiki is, and, and the wiki is going to be used by every faculty this week. A lot of the work examples, a lot of the answers, a lot of the questions, everything will be on the wiki. So make sure you can you set up your desktop so you, on on um, on a Mac. I, I have a and I'm sure, I know Windows you can do that as well. You have different desktops. You have one desktop with one thing, and then you just switch between the desktops. You copy and paste from one desktop to the other, and it's very convenient, especially when you're on uh, I have less resolution. So you have the wiki set up. So and you know where all the lectures are. All the lectures are in your book, but they're also electronically on the wiki. So everything is there, and download it. You know, save it, and so forth. Um, I've actually added pre-lecture material reading. 
that you should read over lunch? No, just kidding. <laughs> I've added some more papers to the list. So they're all open access papers. You can download those papers and, and keep them and, and use them and so forth. I'll be re referring to them and you can read them uh, later or ask me questions about them later. Uh, and you now know how to log into AWS. Any questions? And uh, so mostly uh, you should you don't need to log to have your laptop for this part. So you can turn flip down your laptops unless you need it, as Michelle mentioned. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk to you about right now is I'm going to do that for the next 45 minutes until lunchtime, and then Michelle's going to wave at me when, I'm done, when I have to stop. Is, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, databases and virtualization tool. And I'm going to mostly talk about uh, the importance of databases, not only in cancer genomics, but in, in all bioinformatics uh, as, we, as we do it worldwide, as we do bioinformatics in, in, in all activities, and not necessarily just in cancer. Uh, usual disclaimer, same learning objectives, um, and I'm going to take a little step back because I think it's important to, to really set the, the, the right context, is that uh, about the inferences we make when we're interpreting biological data and we're doing bioinformatics, it's always in the, in the context of evolution. And if, if it wasn't for evolution, none of this would make sense. There's, there's evolution at the sort of the uh, species level, and there's evolution at the uh, within a species, but there's also, of course, evolution within a tumor. And so there's a tumor evolution that uh, the mutations that are acquired by a tumor gave it sort of growth advantages that allow it to, to grow and outdo the other cells around it. So. You have to keep that. It's really important to sort of, uh, and I sort of adapted this line by nothing in bioinformatics makes sense except in the light of evolution. So why do we have bioinformatics? That actually, the reason we have bioinformatics is that we have open data. If we didn't have GenBank, for example, um, things like BLAST would have never been invented. I mean, the reason we have BLAST is that we needed to figure out a way of searching through and growing availability of open data, which was the DNA sequence data uh, in the sort of early 80s and 90s and so forth, uh, which uh, allowed us to, to go find things that were uh, similar to the things that uh, we were looking for. And the main reason for something like BLAST has been used is for uh, finding uh, similarity in sequences and, and from which we infer function. And so it's always so the structure function relationship that we've been doing in bioinformatics uh, for 20, 30 years now, and, and actually longer than that, more like 50 years uh, since the, uh, the, the protein families alignments have been done in the early 60s. So, um, so how, would you, how do we define a bioinformatics? And this is something you, I'm sure you've done. You all have the same answer, so I'm going to ask you. So I'm going to ask you to, to pair up together, to write down in 140 characters or less your definition of bioinformatics. So pair up with the person next to, to you and, and write down what your definition of bioinformatics is. Okay. Well, here's mine. Actually, it is more than 140 characters. <laughs> and it's about integrating uh, biological uh, themes together with the help of computer tools and biological databases and gaining new knowledge about the systems and study. And uh, this is really, huh? That's what, we said. That's what you said, yes. <laughs> you must have, <laughs> must have read my book. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, so we're, we're so and a bioinformatician is, uh, different people have, you know, or computational biologists, lots of people have different definitions of what they, those people are. And are they tool developers? Are they tool users? Are they website users and so forth. I'm very uh, generalist and I include all of those people uh, being involved in computational or bioinformatics activities. Even the difference between bioinformatics and computational biology, some people have gone to war over these, uh, these two terms and I, 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 I don't go there. So it's, I really try to uh, use, I try to use both interchangeably. 
So as, yes? There he is, this very slippery slope you enter, my friend. So, yeah. So are you writing up a CV for a job application or something? <laughs> so there are institutions that will, they, they will seek a computational biologist that they're looking for. And they, there's lots of people who have made this sort of distinction between sort of more technology versus uh, scientific endeavor uh, versus uh, algorithm development. Uh, that said, uh, I've seen the other as well. So it's, you, you have to be, I, I prefer to be inclusive and to include everybody in the fun. So that's definitely uh, uh, the way I, I look at things. So one of the things about uh, doing a bioinformatics experiment is considering the database as one of your reagents for your experiment. And so it's a really sort of uh, way of thinking about uh, a, a computational experiment as having reagents and you do things and you record it and, and so forth. So um, it's really as far databases as one of these reagents, it's an organized array of information. It's a place where you put things in and if all is well, you should be able to get them back out again. There's lots of databases that people load data and then they can't find the data again. So that's not a very good database. Uh, it's a resource for other databases and, and tools to use. So obviously if you have a database that has uh, an application programming interface that allows other tools and other people through the web to get stuff out, that's, that's, a, that's a useful database. Um, and uh, a bonus is that it, it allows you to make discoveries, to find association between things that uh, you didn't know existed beforehand. And so that's a, that's a very well designed database that, that will allow you to make that kind of stuff. And what's always important when you're sort of using a database or building a database, but mostly when you're using one, is to understand how are they organizing the information here? What are the, what do the identifiers mean? What do, if the identifier changes, what, what does that mean? What are the organisms, organism and organismal scope of this database, for example, and, and bioinformatics, uh, and so forth. So those are all sort of very interesting, important things. So a bioinformatics experiment, if you do a BLAST search, for example, you have to know your reagent. So you have to know the sequence, the query sequence you're using, and the database that you're searching against. Uh, you have to know the, the tools you're using. And so the, which method are you using? Are you doing a BLAST piece or protein against protein, or are you doing a uh, T blast X, which will be a, a, a translation of your nucleotide against a translation of the database. And so understanding all the, and the implications of using one type or any other is, is very important as well. And uh, at the end, the alignment, you have interpretation, the, the similarity, the hypothesis testing, and so forth. And so it's important to know your reagents. It's important to know your methods. And it's also important to do controls. So what kind of control can you do with a BLAST search? Well, one type of control is, is do I find the sequence I'm, I'm expecting, the one that I know is there, do I find it? If I don't find it, then maybe the, the database I'm searching against is not the right database. Maybe the parameters I'm using, I'm using the default parameters, and I'm not able to find the things I'm looking for and so forth. So understanding the parameters, understand. so you shouldn't consider these tools. I'm using BLAST as an example, but it could be any tool you're going to be using this week is that if you use it as a black box and you're just sticking stuff in and looking at what's coming out the other end, it's going to be really bad news. And so it's really critical in these bioinformatics experiments that we're going to do this week to understand what you're putting in and what you're coming out, what's coming out at the other end and why things are behaving the way they're not. And sometimes, or the way they are, and sometimes if they're not behaving the way you expect them to behave, is there, it, there could be there's something wrong. Maybe Amazon's not happy. Maybe uh, the, uh, the, the start with the wrong file, the wrong file format, and so forth. And, and you're missing some parameters, you have the wrong parameters, and so forth. So those are all really sort of critical things. And another thing about databases is that we, uh, I remember this is less prevalent now, but I remember in, in the 90s and in the 2000s, people used to complain all the time. Oh, Gen Bank is full of garbage, blah, 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 you know. But then they would say that at meetings or they'd say that in papers, but they wouldn't tell Gen Bank folks. 
And so it's really, and, it, and GenBank is a resource, and all these databases at NCBI or at EBI are all these public resources that are, are there for us to use. So it's really critical that if we do find a mistake, that we report it and we tell them, you know, there's a, because if you don't report it, somebody else is going to find the mistake or somebody else is going to misinterpret something. And so it's really, it's our responsibility as citizens of, of bioinformaticians worldwide, computational biologists worldwide. It's really our responsibility to, to, to report these, these challenges or these problems if we come across them. And sometimes they're not a problem. It's you don't know how to use the tool. And so if you report it, you know, the, the database people will be more than happy to, to set you straight. And so I, just a quick overview of databases and the various sort of layers of, of, of way we can think about it. So the data itself, so GenBank flat file, cosmic record, an interaction record, protein-protein interaction record, titles of a book, the book itself, that's part of your data. The storage system um, could be a box, or it could be Oracle, it could be MySQL, it could be a, a PC binary file, Unix text file, or bookshelf. These are all the, the, the storage system the layers that we have to sort of, the query system, so a list you look at, a catalog, index files, a structured query language, or grep, which is a Unix tool that allows you to go find, look through text files quite rapidly. And uh, the information system, so the Library of Congress in the US is an information system. Google is an information system. Entrée at NCBI, Ensemble is an information system. And the UCSC Genome Browser, these are all sort of complicated, very structured, and to really get the maximum of each of these, you have to go uh, deep into, into them and, and understand what's happening. So the databases have been uh, growing. This is from a few years ago already, and uh, it's quite a lot of stuff that we uh, have to look at. If you look at uh, sort of things from 12 years beforehand, you can see, I think it's the next one, yeah. You see that some of the, like the nucleotide records, there's been a 32-fold increase. So from 4 million records uh, in uh, 1999, to uh, 144 million records in 2011. And now we're in uh, quite a bit more. I remember, so I used to work at NCBI. I was there until 97. I think we, we had a party when we hit 1 million. And so I remember, and when I started there in 93, so this, you know, six years before that, there was 300,000 records in GenBank. So it just gives you a, a scale of things, how they've changed over the years. So, um, the, the tools have changed also, and if you look, this is actually the, the number of records in all the databases, and to get to this page, you put in a query, all, this is a sort of a under the hood secret, how do you get this page, with, to get the numbers of all the databases, you, in the query you type all in the square bracket filter, and if you put this query in, then you get all the numbers of all, how many records there is in each of these databases, so you should do that later. So formats are, are very important. So we're going to talk, actually I'm not going to talk about VCF format because that's going to come later in the course, but VCF is a, a, a variant uh, file format that we, we look at, but be, they're based on, on older format, they're based on, on, on old things that are really sort of important, sort of crucial to understand. The GenBank flat file is basically most of you, who has not seen a GenBank flat file? I hope it's okay. okay. Yeah. So it's basically the unit record in GenBank, which has uh, information about the whole record. So it will have a publication, it will have an organism. They don't have specific information about features in that record. Let's say for uh, it will have a protein coding sequence, which is going to be a segment within a messenger RNA. And then it will have the sequence itself. And so the header will have the, 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 the title, the taxonomy, citation features amino acid sequence and then the DNA sequence. GenBank is uh, organism agnostic in the sense that it will use, it will, it's not just human, of course, it's everything. Uh, even uh, there's some, a few synthetic sequences uh, that have sn snuck in there over the years and um, which are like clones and things like that. 
that have been constructed and it says it's been useful to have them in GenMax. So there's a separate division for those records. But they all have the same uh, features. The GenBank flat file that we we're looking at here is considered a human readable format. But there are so many bioinformaticians worldwide that have parsed and, and tried to sort of work off of this file format, which was never meant to be a parsable format. It was never meant to be able to identify all the various fields in a way for a computer to look at it. It was always meant for humans to look at it. But that doesn't stop bioinformaticians. <laughs> And then there, there have been lots and lots and lots of people that have parsed these files. There are other file formats much better than this, but they, they've not picked up these. This is like just the most uh, popular file format. More popular than GenBank file file format would be the FASTA file format, which is sort of the, it's become the default sort of uh, sequence file. It's for the same file for nucleotides or protein, so you, and there's no way of knowing ahead of time until you look at the file whether it's nucleotide or protein. And all FASTA files have a greater than sign on the first line. They have a string of something, and then they have a sequence. That's about the formula, the definition. This could be, this is a FASTA file. It's got nothing else on it, and that's good. It's not very useful because you sort of lose track of what's in there. And so to have... So this is an NCBI formatted FASTA file, which has a GI uh, number or GI string, which means gen, gen info. And this is a GI number. It came from SwissBrot, so it's SP, the SwissBrot accession number, and then the SwissBrot name. And so that's what this file is. It's a it's it's a yeast GCN4 uh, protein. So sequences come in uh, primary uh, archival databases. And so there's GenBank, Uniprot, PDB. So protein and, and, and text intact is a protein-protein interaction. And it, there are what I call secondary. These are curated, but they're not as curated as these secondary databases, which are take this data and, and add another level of curation. So RefSeq is, is very commonly used, uh, will be used by us this week in the sense that uh, RefSeq is the reference sequence for the human genome. Uh, all the transcripts, the RefSeq transcripts are, are used uh, often in, as references uh, in, in a lot of genome browsers. Taxon database, so it's a taxonomic database, which is a, um, all the taxonomy, and it's actually very hard to maintain and it requires, uh, but you need to, basically you need a, an authority. You need experts in the field to tell you this is this organism and not that organism, and this is the lineage and so forth. For human, it's not a big problem because we're sort of pretty much agreed upon, but if you start looking at marsupials and, and different sort of weirder organisms and bacteria, is, up to wazoo is, 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 is very uh, complicated. And so NCBI, is a maintainer of the taxonomic database for all the nucleotide and protein sequence databases. And they are, um, uh, they are the final authority with respect to sequence databases. And they use sequence to help them whenever there's some discrepancy. And so the beak size may sort of put some, some organism in a different group, but the sequence says they're in that group, so that's that's, that's that. Um, there's uh, SGDs uh, is one of the model organism databases. So this for Saccharomyces. There's one for mouse. There's one for rat. There's one for uh, zebrafish and so forth. These are all very critical for human because a lot of our human knowledge actually comes from from the model organism databases. OMIM is uh, online Mendelian inheritance in man, which is basically a disease uh, linking disease to 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 genes. So every year. The nucleic acid research publishes in January the database issue, and this is uh, sort of the the best place to get the reference for all the database. Uh, and there are actually so many databases that they don't publish. Databases don't publish there every year; they publish there every second year. So to get a full sort of picture of the full set of databases that are available, you actually have to look at the last two years worth of, of, of database issue. So this is uh, this January, 
And this is a uh, paper I added to your list, which is the NCBI uh, resources. And this is last January, and there's more papers. And so I uh, mentioned archival and so forth. So, so GenBank um, is referenced here. It's the genetic sequence database of all publicly available sequences. And there's actually NCBI that produces GenBank as part of a three-way relationship between the Japanese, the Europeans, and the Americans, and where you submit to only one of these, and it ends up being part of of uh, of uh, of the of the of GenBank basically. So you can submit through Japan; it goes into the DBJ, but then it gets picked up by NCBI and the EBI, and so. You only need to submit to one. You don't need to submit to all three, but it appears, in, and these three databases are basically equivalent. Um, the thing about GenBank, there are many, many file types. There are many uh, various um, tags and, and features and so forth. I'm just going to sort of c touch on a few of them, which are I think are important for, for us this week. But keep in mind that there's lots more that, that I'm not covering. Um, there are organismal divisions, so for example, bacterial, primate, rodents, and so forth, and those are actually historical. They're just ways of limiting file size and then when they were being distributed and so forth, and it actually doesn't make sense anymore. That's why there's like hundreds, some of these have come in hundred, you know, there's uh, hundred bacterial files and so forth because the, the one was too big and so they broke it up into multiple files. But more important are these sort of what I call functional divisions. And they're uh, ways of, of that sort of made sense to partition things into separate piles. And so uh, during the, the Human Genome Project, for example, uh, because there was a mandate to get the data out within 24 hours of having it off the sequencers, there a lot of data wasn't finished. And so it was being assembled it was a first sort of assembly done, but it was just a bunch of pieces. And so and some, some of the groups were doing it sort of back by back across the genome. But even a back, you, you, your first run, you got a bunch of pieces and so forth. And so they put this in, in the HTG, the high throughput uh, genome, uh, which is unfinished genome. So if you see a record in there, it is still working on it. It's still not finished. And so uh, more and more, and once it got finished, then it became, uh, if it was human, then it got part of uh, primates. So PIR, so it is for primates. And so same with all of these ESTs were a good place, express sequence tags, they're short reads, single reads from technology that used to generate uh, three, four, 500 base pairs at a time. Uh, they used to contaminate the, the databases until people figured out, let's put them all in one pile and let's compute on them separately, and then they became useful as a separate pile. Contaminated amongst all the other ones, it didn't make sense, but having them in a separate pile made them uh, useful. And so a guiding principle in, in GenBank and a lot of databases, if you, things are grouped together for a certain reason, and understanding why things are grouped that way makes a lot of sense. So this, uh, the identifiers is going to be as actually one of the most critical things that, that, uh, from, from my lecture today is to understand how important and what the identifier means. And so um, I'm going to skip. And there are different parts, right? There's the, the DNA itself, the genes, the transcripts, the proteins, and so forth. So in a GenBank record, I'm going to skip that right away. So. Each GenBank record has a locus line. So the first line of a GenBank record is a locus line. has a locus ID, which is actually a very bad ID. Don't use this ID. So why should I not use this ID? Actually, between GenBank, NCB, uh, DDBJ, and EBI, they have, most of them are the same, but sometimes they're, they're not the same. And so the, you get the, the fact that the same ID has got different value in different places across the world. That's not very useful. The accession number, on the other hand, is a very good ID because that's a unique identifier to this record. Okay. 
And uh, a few years ago, they started adding version numbers. That is even more important. So what does, it, what does that mean when the version number changes? No, that's not what that means. Variance? Sorry? No. Variance? No, no, not that, nothing to do with variance. If I go, if I switch from, it goes from U40282.1 and it becomes dot two. What does that tell me? Change. What has changed? The record? Presumably. Okay. The actual sequence. The actual sequence. So all the version number tells you, when there's a change in the version number, that means the sequence has changed. It could have changed by one nucleotide, or it could have changed by five megabases, or, I mean, or any, any number. So it doesn't tell you, it doesn't refer to the size of the change. It just tells you that this is no longer the same sequence. And that's all it means. It could be, for example, if this is an accession number on an mRNA, if I change the coding sequence, but I don't change the mRNA sequence, and I get a new record coming out in a database, uh, it's, it won't change this number. The version number will not change because it's still the same nucleotide sequence. The protein sequence has a dot version as well. So if the protein sequence change, then it will increment. And if I have a nucleotide change and it, that produces an, an amino acid change, then both will change. But the version number change in GenBank and in uh, other things as well means that there's a sequence change. Yes? Is there a good way to tell what changes have been made? Yes. Yeah, you're, you skip a few pages, you'll see. <laughs> so historically, before the three nucleotide databases agreed upon this structure of accession dot version number. Um, the other databases didn't want to do it. So NCBI actually hid the same information in, in the GI number. And GI stands for gen info. So, so all records still have GI numbers, but now you don't really need, the, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between an accession dot version and a GI. The difference is that the next, if, I, if the sequence were going to change, this would become dot two, and the next GI could be some other string of, of numbers. So you would, you'd have no relationships between them. You, wouldn't, you couldn't tell if the, the two GI numbers were related unless you looked in this record. So this record would have, this was the old GI, this is the new GI. But what it does have is that if it's dot two, then you know it was replaced dot one. And as I alluded to, this didn't exist at the beginning of the database. So there's a bunch of records that had a bunch of changes that were dot zero forever, basically. So that never changed. So the dot one, when, when this was introduced, everything became dot one, even though there may have been historically a lot of changes beforehand. Fortunately, most of the data that's coming into GenBank came this year and not the first five years. Because in the first five years, there's only one million records. And now we're in hundreds of millions of records. So most of the data, if you made a data change or a structure, you know, a sort of model change, then it, it, it makes sense to... So then proteins I mentioned, so protein have GI numbers as well, and they also have, uh, there's a protein field that has accession dot number structure. So if you go to a GenBank record at NCBI, you pop down the display menu, then you have a revision history. And so, uh, I'm looking at now this accession number 0055.7.7, and I sort of click on these two, and then I can see the difference between the two records. So the date is different, uh, the taxonomy change, the sequence change, well, if the, the GI number changed and the sequence changed, and so, and it, actually, I can see that it's actually 20 nucleotides shorter. And the uh, newer, actually, the newer record has is, is lost 20 nucleotides. So it's, it's not one, it's not a million, but it's 20. And so that's why it's a different GI number. And it's a different version number. So it's switched from dot six to dot seven. 
the GI number change. And you see the GI numbers don't make any relationships to each other, but now we, we understand uh, the differences. And this, uh, I did that between looking between six and seven, actually it's highlighted wrong here, but it, between six and seven, but down here, while it's zero all the time, there's different GI numbers, the sequence change, but in 1999, they instituted the, the dot version numbers, and so that became dot one, and then thereafter, the more changes. That said, most records in GenBank don't change. Most people, they submit something to GenBank and they, they forget about it. So, but if they do change it, and some people are very attached to their sequence, uh, they, they take very good care and sort of lots of tender loving care and so forth. And so this happens. All the records in GenBank belong to the submitter. So NCBI is not even allowed to go change it. It's not NCBI doing these changes. It's the author doing the change. If there's a change that needs to be done, the, the database may contact you and says, we noticed some vector contamination in your file. Can we remove it? And they'll say, sure, yes, please. You know, this is very embarrassing and so forth. Yes? Do record was suggested that session number means they are somehow related or that session number is just a random number? So it's not random. It could be, uh, this, so there's no implicit relationship between two accession numbers that follow each other, except if I submit two sequences, I will get two successive accession numbers. So it's useful if I'm submitting 100 sequences that in my paper I will say from this one to that one, these are all mine. And so I will, I will get 100 consecutive accession numbers. And the same way, I think, it sort of showed up here. Um, C three one five. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the the GI we're also uh, given uh, successfully. So the GI of the DNA and the GI of the protein are off by one digit. So in the old days. Accession numbers were one letter plus five digits, so L12345 or U001. And then we ran out of space. So then we have two plus six, so we have AF and AC and so forth. And then next gen sequencing started coming. And then there were so many sequences that never made it into GenBank. There's actually more stuff not in GenBank than there is in GenBank. So if you take the pile, if you read the, the GenBank release notes, they'll tell you. We have 150 million records or 200 million records, but there's also 200 million records of whole genome sequencing that we have not, we're not putting in GenBank right now. They're sort of in, in process. And what does that mean? That means they're not shared. So if it's in GenBank, then it's shared with DDBJ and, and, and Europeans. But if it's not shared, then it just, you can only, the only place to find it is at NCPI. So how do you get to that data and what's in that data? That data is going to have lots of, of projects from uh, obscure and not so obscure organisms that are just in process. And so they're not assembled, they're not finished, they're not, but they want, they're, they're making, the submitters are making the data available. So NCBI is making it available, but there's so much data that they're not sharing with everybody until it's more advanced. And so how do you query this? You can go look, there's a website I'll show you, or you can, there's a blast, you can, tell BLAST to go look at this pile of unknown stuff. And, and you, you know, buyer beware. Uh, it's stuff that's not curated, it's, it's just off the machine, basically. But if you're looking for your favorite gene, you may want to go do the extra work to go hunt that piece of DNA down. So there's uh, the concept of a secondary accession numbers. And so the accession line here will have U00096, and then it will have actually this string here, uh, AE00111 dash AE00. So this is actually like 400 records, which are now secondary to this primary record. And this is, this is a little historical. Historically, GenBank, only maximum size is 250 KB. And this is because a bunch of software, that's all they could handle. And the NCBI was <coughs> kind to those softwares. Uh, some of you, anybody ever use GCG? No? Yes? So GCG had a 350K file size limit. 
And so when the E. coli genome came out, which was five megabases, they broke it down into a bunch of records. And, uh, and so, but then they removed the file size limit, so they stuck them all back together. So E. coli now is happy as one piece of DNA of five megabases. But historically, it's been published as separate pieces. And so if you query for any one of the pieces, then you have to go be able to find it. So that's, this takes care of that. So, uh, yeah, so this is all basically how it looks like on the E. coli genome, which is now 4.6 megabases. So express sequence tags, I mentioned quickly. So this is a dog sequence. And the important part about a, a, a EST is, is because it's an mRNA, it's a tag of, of gene expression. So where is it expressed and under what condition? And so which cell line, which uh, developmental stage, and so forth. Those are the key things. Not necessarily what does it encode, because you're going to computationally derive that uh, from the EST data. Because the EST data, the other thing about the EST data is sort of the, the ends of the record are less uh, lower quality. And so, and there are still surprising how many ESTs are still coming out. I mean, there's, uh, uh, and of course now RNA-seq is going to supersede all of this, but it's, uh, and there's a separate division for that as well. Actually, this is uh, shotgun, transcriptome shotgun data, uh, speaking of which, is basically a merging of ESTs and, and next-gen data. And it's a computationally assembled uh, record. <coughs> Uh, so, yeah, and the big difference is that t uh, transcriptional shotgun assemblies are not uh, different from EST and GenBank, in that there is no physical counterpart in, of these assemblies. In EST, there's always a cDNA clone somewhere in a fridge, and a, a TSA record does not necessarily have that. So it'll be, a, uh, there's not, the, there's, as John mentioned earlier, there's not the clone equivalent and when you sequence. And so that's what those records look like. And uh, they'll have protein IDs and so forth. So this is, I just mentioned, to so the whole genome, WGS records, ongoing whole genome shotgun sequencing projects. Uh, you can find them with BLAST. There's more information there. And they have, yet again, a different uh, accession number because you can use up accession numbers quite fast. Uh, so this is 4 plus 2 plus 6, so, and there's a page which has all the projects. This is a four-letter code, the two-letter project code, and then the organism, and how, where, what state that, that project is. So you can find it here, or you, as I mentioned, in BLAST. So in GenBank, it's pretty sort of cryptic, not that much information. There might be a paper. It's a paper from the Broad. Um, and basically just organism information and then the sequence. These sequences are not in GenBank. Uh, WGS, I just mentioned. TPA, third-party annotation. So third-party annotation used to be frowned upon and not allowed in GenBank. Still not. But there will, there's a place for them at NCBI. And NCBI will take them if there's a publication attached to it. So if, you, so if you, you're reanalyzing somebody else's data, and you wrote a paper, the paper was published, then you can put in the TPA. SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, we're going to talk a lot about this week. They're not in GenBank per se, right? They're in SNPDB. So there's a separate database for, for SNPs. Uh, SAGE, which is another sort of gene expression uh, tag, uh, they're, they're in GEO, they're somewhere else. RefSeq, so RefSeq, those are like creme de la creme of all the GenBank records. Those are Basically, it was NCBI's trick for, to edit a record. So if I take the best mRNA sequences, for example, from the human genome, and I want to annotate them all the same way across an organism, how do I do that? So I take the ones from GenBank, which are open and available, I make them my own, I edit them, and I put them in a separate database. In the RefSeq database, all the records in RefSeq come from GenBank. So they all were sequenced by somebody and so forth. But they all got re-annotated and re-curated in a standard way across the whole set. And so you have RefSeq of mRNA, you have RefSeq of proteins, you have RefSeqs of genomes. So all of these three uh, spaces have 
Uh, they're all uniform, and, and they're supposed to be. And not all organisms have ref sequ uh, sequences, but uh, many of them do. Uh, Unipro KB. Let me let me stop here. Actually, I'm going to stop here, and then we'll we'll finish uh, this after lunch. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Concerns? You all know about GI numbers now. Good. Thank you.